Um, <clears throat> I'm not really going to do uh, my talking until after I play this track. Um, and then I'll have some kind of introductory things to say. But I'm going to try as hard as I can to, um, to let the songs do more of the work, um, uh, which is actually uh, quite difficult because um, uh, I get behind one of these and in front of one of these and I want to do one of those philosopher things. Um, but uh, this song is called uh, Pioneer's Porch Number One. I recorded this song um, for my 2014 album, Fury Loving, on Bill Pinar's porch. And um, the song was largely based on some chimes that are on his porch that made a <laughs> But just the first one. They're they kind of made the da 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 And that made me think a little bit about um, how nice that sounded, and I kind of took off from there. Uh, the, uh, there is a part two, uh, which I won't play, but if you're interested, you can hear uh, that other part as well. And so this is uh, Pioneer's Porch 1. <laughs>
Uh, several people in the room. Uh, we have Daha here in the front who appears on uh, three tracks and is really featured on the title track in particular, uh, uh, singing a, uh, a song in, in, in Farsi that is uh, a part of the uh, Shia Ashura um, uh, um, uh, ritual and, and holy days. Um, I do have some samplings, so you can see there's a Congolese uh, boys choir singing the Kibie from the uh, Roman Catholic Mass. It's from an album called uh, Misa Luba. Um, it was recorded a long time ago. The Sistine Choir Chapel singing Palestrina. And um, a really interesting, and I thought really beautiful recording of Coro uh, de Mocas, this means uh, choir of nuns, uh, at a convent singing in Andalusia uh, on the strict condition that they not know they were being recorded, which it was in the liner notes that said that. So I stole a couple of things off of those that we added those in. Um, but you can get a sense of some of the, it's a, the, the one warning is that if you really like the acoustic-ness of the show here, don't expect it to be replicated on the album. It's fairly ambient and atmospheric and kind of soundscapey in the style of Brian Eno's music and Daniel Lanois and things like that. Um, I've always loved, especially Lanois in particular, because he's an incredible slide guitar player, but, um, and he's not afraid to take huge risks in, as, a, as a production artist, but at the same time, he can jump on the bandstand and grab his Les Paul or his, and just sort of go to town. And I, I think that that's, that there's something to be said about that. Um, I wasn't going to say this, but I guess I should now because I'm feeling it more. One of my favorite lines in the Confessions, which is probably my favorite book, is in Book 9 and Part 32, where Augustine uses three Latin words, all of them declining in different ways, to say something along the lines of, I grieved for my own grief, or I... I, I I would probably say, with a new sorrow, I felt sorry for my own sorrow, or something along those lines. That's how I would parse that, that passage in Latin. And um, <laughs> I don't mean to say that I'm grieving, but it's totally bizarre to me that I feel really nervous about this show. I've been playing for 32 years, and I've been playing percussion for 20 years, and I feel really nervous. And then the fact that I feel nervous, and I think that's weird, is making me really nervous. So I feel <laughs> nervous about feeling nervous. <laughs> um, and so it just made me think of that passage from Augustine. And I, I, my mom didn't die, but it, it's, it's, I just thought maybe that will have something to say about this. Now, the title of the work is Anamnesis. And I think we have to be really careful for maybe philosophical and other reasons about what we expect from a title of a work of art. It's not obvious to me that the title of the work of art is like a, a, like a packaging label for some chicken or something like that. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's supposed to have the same functional usage of, <clears throat> you could say, um, something like an ingredients list or something. And I hope that this isn't taken to be a list of ingredients. Uh, but I do want to honor the sense that words mean things and that one should honor where things come from to some extent. And I want to show you in two slides um, three senses of the word anamnesis that you could perhaps use to prime your sense of what this music might look like. But then I'd really like to let the music work itself out through playing some of the music, going all the way back to the 2011 album, and walking our way towards the present album, and getting some help from some friends as we move along. So the most simple way to talk about the word anamnesis, as I understand it, would be as follows. We have this attic, and that just refers to the Greek uh, dialect, um, or Socratic, and of course by Socratic we mean Plato's hand, not Socrates, because he didn't leave us much uh, other than Plato. So um, in Plato's, Mino, we have anamnesis out of the mouth of the character Socrates. Um, you'll recall that this happens um, just before the uh, uh, just before Socrates asks Mino you know, if his uh, slave speaks Greek. So it's right after the sequence where Mino you know, accuses Socrates of looking like a sort of torpedo fish and acting like a torpedo fish. And then they go through this whole thing. And this is um, repeated at the end of the um, geometry lesson that Socrates and the slave boy and the Mino you know, have. And it essentially just says that all learning it is nothing but recollection, and the word anamnesis is used for that idea of recollection, which is um, repeated in uh, uh, the Phaedo and, and also in the Phaedrus. And I think it's a it's one of the most more well known I think uh, ideas of Plato, which is the idea that not only all learning is recollection, but also by extension 
that all knowledge on a platonic understanding would be innate. Um, that's the idea. An idea that's fallen out of, you might say, pedagogical fashion, um, but I don't see a lot of compelling evidence against it, regardless of the fact that a lot of full-blown constructivists seem to even in their own concepts, conceptions of constructivism, have some psychological entity that they assume within it. And so I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced, actually, that Anonesis hasn't gone the way of, uh, of the past. Um, the second place we see Anonesis occur, which I think is actually, uh, uh, like, I think we have to lift up our pen and have and kind of reset our minds and think of what it's going to come up with, is in um, the Koine dialect of Greek, which, of course, is the, the, the language that the New Testament is written in. And uh, so in the Christian New Testament, we see Anamnesis, uh, I think it comes up in two places, the Gospel of Luke and also in Corinthians, but I thought the Luke one would be the one that would be more recognizable. And this is through the voice of uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who at the Last Supper asked his apostles to uh, do this in memory of me, and the word memory in that case is uh, Anamnesis. So we have the idea of memory. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the liturgical meaning of anamnesis in the context of uh, theology and liturgical theology, Eucharistic theology, Christian theology, um, it kind of develops a life of its own that isn't always obvious to me that it has anything to do actually with the psychological, um, platonic, or even the, even the spiritual neoplatonic tradition I think is a bit different. And the reason I want to get to that is I did, I, there is a source that seems to help itself to both at the same time, in a way that I find remarkably original. And it's also, though, going to be a bit of a joke because you'll just see how the words work. Uh, this is a joke and it's not a joke. Anyone who wants to like parse this passage very closely with me is welcome to do so. Uh, on, a, on another occasion, um, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not using it as a sort of, uh, um, as an excuse to not go into more depth, but in, in this uh, short uh, set of two talks given by, at the time, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, while he was the prefect for the Congregation for the Congregation of the Faith in the Vatican, he went on to change his name to Benedict XVI. Um, he gave these two lectures, one in the early 80s and one in the early 90s, and they were both basically given to theologians and bishops sitting in the room together. And the, the question of the both lectures were identical. It was basically, should theologians obey their bishops uh, when they're writing theology, uh, which believe it or not is an open question. Uh, and then on the other hand, should bishops pay attention to what theologians write and say uh, for their pastoral work. Um, out of this, Benedict, does something that I think he does a lot in his theology, uh, and his philosophy, well, basically to make theology philosophical again, and to, in some sense, randomly replace things that were are, that were always a certain way. Like, I see Benedict as arguably maybe one of the most radical intellectuals of the 20th century, because in the spirit of the noble theology, he very much kind of just throws out stuff he doesn't like. And here we can see him doing that, the scene that I see. Synderesis in the, in the medieval scholastic tradition is basically the idea that the conscience is the, um, within, the, Aristotle had that like three, divide, the platonic division where you have the rational part of the soul. So the scholastics said, well, conscience is the um, moral, the faculty of moral reasoning, and that's primarily what the conscience is and what it does. This is a bit different from the platonic and the earlier Augustinian model, and Benedict, um, or Ratzinger as an Augustinian, he just swaps out synderesis, that very much rational Aristotelian idea of conscience, for anamnesis. <laughs> and he doesn't offer an argument for it, um, but he exposes it through Basil and through Scripture, Paul and through all these. And he arrives at this idea that the um, that conscience begins in essentially that platonic capacity for recollection, and he removes, you could say, conscience from its more Aristotelian rational faculty, and he places it within a uh, more hidden domain um, than it's traditionally been within the, 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 the medieval scholastic tradition. Uh, this stuck out to me for a number of reasons, principally among them the fact that this 
is reminiscent to me of some of my um, misgivings about um, the psychological assumptions we make with respect to what we mean when we talk about education. And I mean that in very concrete ways, like what is learning, how does it happen, those kind of, what is teaching, uh, those happens. You'll notice that the, the line of argument that, that, that Rodsinger or Benedict provides here is identical really to what we find in Augustine's short, um, also in book nine, he talks about it because his son is at the bedside of his mom when she passes away, Adeodatus. His book, De Magistro, which is on the teacher. In that book, Augustine comes up to the point that he says, it's impossible to teach. Teaching doesn't happen. There is no such thing as teaching because the only person who teaches is the inner teacher. And the inner teacher, of course, for Augustine is Christ. Right. And this is, I think, this enigma that some people thought Ranciere invented, which is hilarious, but it's not true. Um, but this enigma that's been at the heart, I think, of, of questions of education, philosophy of education, for those of us who take education to be not only embedded in, but inextricably, inextricably linked to teaching. I think that's, that's a part of uh, the set of questions. So the last resource, and then I'll stop talking again. Uh, all of this he frames, and I don't have time to go into it, it's really a tragedy that I can't do that now, uh, I think about it. All of this he, he threads through um, John Cardinal Newman and his version of the conscience, which was also a radical deviation from the scholastic, Thomistic, Aristotelian tradition, and much more in, in, in line with the Augustinian tradition. Where, uh, and this is his expression, I'm using this expression verbatim from his, uh, 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 one of his letters. He calls the conscience the aboriginal vicar of Christ. That's the <coughs> way of really talking about conscience. It's the aboriginal vicar of Christ. So it's identical, basically, in substance to, to Augustine's idea of the inner teacher, or that the Christ is the inner teacher. Um, however, in the case of Newman, um, he slightly secularizes. It doesn't sound very secular, but believe it or not, it's a little <laughs> bit more secular. Um, and I think Ratzinger actually makes it full-blown a secular concept because he doesn't turn to Christology. He just sticks with Plato. He goes into this pre-Christian argument. And I think there's a lot of um, cool ways to think through that. So whenever I'm placing this title on this album, these are some of the ways we might think of the tradition that informs this that also shows what this has to do with previous work I've done and stuff. But for now, I'm going to kind of lean back a bit into what we might say the um, uh, the idea of conscience that sits at that kind of spark level that I think music is especially equipped to speak to. And Plato was aware of this in the Republic. That's why he said we had the sense of the poets and sense of music and modes and all that stuff. I think this has been something that people understand, that aesthetic education is dangerous. And so this is, um, uh, in hopes of that, I don't normally share my lyrics, but I want to share the lyrics so that you can kind of, if you choose to, use them to kind of think through. This is just a love ballad, just a love song. And um, it's called There Was a Boy. I wrote it, um, it's kind of a Bildungsroman of a story. And if you look at the picture of freedom for love, the, the, the kind of the blooming thing, it's very much in that kind of developmentalist idea of, of building. Um, and, um, one of the key themes that I wanted, that I chose these songs to share with you are the idea of staying and going, and the difference between staying and going, and, and kind of what, how things are at stake, staying and going. On my view, Benedict practiced his, his idea of conscience whenever he told the College of Cardinals, I'm leaving. Namely, I, I quit being Pope for the first time in 100 years. To me, that was a beautiful act of conscience in line with his idea of anamnesis as the seat of conscience as opposed to singeresis. So, whether you want to take a more intellectual line or you just want to listen to the love song, I don't really uh, care. It's really what it means to you, but this song is called There Was a Boy. There was a boy, his name was me. He always dreamed. What love would be like, he thought of love, to be full of joy. But he was wrong, see, I was only a boy. And now I'm not born, I'm becoming 
learning a man, I'm learning a love, and of who I am, the more that I learn, the more I am taught, precisely what true love. Because love isn't always happy, love isn't always glad, but love is never angry, love is never mad, and I know for me to love you, that I must show that I love you enough to let. I knew that love was patient I knew that love was kind But I never knew That in love I find and Days without breath Nights without sleep A siege on my mind A vigil for me to keep Seems split in two, but still through it all, might be in love with you. This isn't what you see to that boy before, but be sure that I do this and more. Love isn't always happy, love isn't always glad, but love is never angry, no, love is never mad, and I know for me to love you, that I must show, that I love you enough to let. Well, I can't live without you, you must always be convinced that in my love's arms you are free, you are free to love and to be happy, to love and to be glad, to love and not be
this next song gets a little bit even more into the weeds uh, in terms of references, and I just want to mention one part. So the song, well, two, okay. So the song is really, it's from my album on Augustine, um, and it goes to the classic, I think it's a, what, second paragraph of Our Hearts Are Restless Until They're Rested Together, do you kind of notice that? Um, uh, however, there's a really important part that I think is, is even more important about education uh, than anything else probably on the, on the album that I had to pull in some reinforcements, namely the work of Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, the idea of the acoustic genius of love. So uh, Nietzsche has this idea of the acoustic designation of genius. It's one of the early lectures that he gives, uh, or one of the like, university lectures. And Nietzsche had this, um, it seems like not a metaphorical, but a literal view that a precondition of, 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 of education, building, self-formation, being human, I feel like, maybe even, was having literal music resonate in your chest cavity. And that was to him the acoustic designation of genius, that the designation of genius as music resonating and, and the, the ability to resonate uh, with music. And that aesthetic sense for Nietzsche was um, constitutive, was a necessary, and we might, I would even say, I haven't read the lecture in a while, but probably a necessary and even sufficient condition for education on, on Nietzsche's understanding of, of education. So to me, that idea of the acoustic designation of genius um, amplifies in some ways um, what the idea of, 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 rest, of the restless heart might, might, might mean in terms of education. So this song uh, is also, I've been told, uh, pretty weird. So um, we're going from a very standard ballad <laughs> to a slightly weirder song. And what are we capable then? Uh, oh, sorry. I got this man from the studio song. Uh, yeah, capable <laughs> too. Song with open the song with the track ten of that same album, which is titled Nemo Est in parentheses Qui Non Amet, which is a Latin phrase that is not from the Confessions. It's from Augustine's work De Trinitate, uh, and it just means um, I am nothing without love. Uh, Nemo Est Qui Non Amet. That's roughly how it translates. Maybe uh, without love I am not, or something along those lines. Um, Mark is giving me eyebrows. It's okay. <laughs> to be honest, I think I might be nervous because there's not a sitting scholar in the room to be a... Um, I'll, just, I'll put all my anxiety on my shoulders, yeah. Um, so I'm going to start off with that piece from Nemo S, the melody, and then I'm going to pull it into the rest of the song.
Um, and so this song is really, a, 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 in terms of coming and going, it's about staying, but staying on the outside, staying outside. And the idea that the, the insideness of, of ideas like anamnesis or the rest of the art or the acoustic that is you know, uh, are meant to be outside. There. And, and in some sense, the work of recording in a studio and then trying to go out and then realizing it's impossible. And so how do we stay in but have the, the sonic impression still be outside, like an outside sense? Um, that's very much... Um, it's very interesting to me. I think it's very difficult. I think it's um, uh, the struggle between interiority and exteriority is, is difficult for, for, for everyone. And I'm not here just talking about philosophy. Like that's it is insides and outsides, holes and parts, uh, particulars, universals. Yeah, I get that. That's hard. It's also though I think hard to be like a person in that in the sense of I am me. My meanness is inside, but I'm not me without someone else. So. It's, it's not obvious, but I, I think, in some sense, we can take even the idea of relations or, or relationality um, as a given instead of as, a, as, a, as an incredible struggle. And that's at least how I experience it. So this song is something of, a, of, a, of an anthem, uh, kind of to myself, <laughs> uh, about staying outside. And I'd like to invite up um, a, another uh, a good friend, um, Colorblind Jefferson. Uh, he's going to join us on the band. Let's give it up.
getting to the end of this lecture, just quickly, that last song was also, um, not going to use profanity in this talk, I promise. Um, there, was a, there was a book that really bothered me that came out that was really popular in kind of Catholic American English circles by Rob Rayer called uh, The Benedict Option, which is all about fortress theology going inside. And so this was my to Rod Dreher. Um, so that anthem was very poignant. Uh, I also wrote a really blistering review of the book, and he got really mad and called me a failed oyster. It's on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah. He also accused me of playing daiquiri music. I don't know what he has against daiquiri. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not good at doing this, uh, and so I'm going to try. Uh, namely promoting my music. So all this music is all online, digitally, at everything you can find, Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, the whole nine yards. I have some of them as physical CDs here um, that will be uh, for sale. Um, uh, and, uh, and I even brought a few books just in case you want to see how the pairings work in terms of the ideas and stuff like that. But um, uh, you can also find all of this. Anamnesis was just uh, it, um, released on Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, December 1st. And if you haven't figured out, by the way, I'm a Roman Catholic. Is there any book about that? <laughs> um, um, I'm also uh, Mexican American, uh, and believe it or not, those two things have a lot to do with each other and the way they appear. And so this guitar is from Baracho Michoacan. It's a Mexican uh, classical guitar. My dad played the. I needed to play both que bonito es, que bonito es, and also to play the, you know, you know the, the, the punk music. And so I had to be able to play between like the different kinds of music. And, and uh, I grew up in Texas, so then I had to learn to play country, country western. Uh, Just a closer walk with me. You know, and then uh, you know, and then they, they, they turn things around and stuff. So I grew up in a, in, a, in, the, in the border area of, the, of Texas and Mexico on both sides, and then in West Texas for a while, most of my life. So in terms of musical influences and the the Spanish Mexican guitar thing and all that, that just comes from that. And I, I didn't leave with the bi biographical or the anecdotal, but <clears throat> in case you're wondering, hopefully we settle all that. Uh, this next song. <laughs> It's probably the most um, <laughs> the most textually specific uh, song. So it's basically, and I, I um, and it's also, uh, and I'm gonna really try to hold it together. Uh, it's a poem that I wrote. Sometimes I write poems and they become songs, and sometimes I write songs and they become poems, and sometimes they just song, the poems say poems and the songs say songs. This is one that became a song, um, and it was trying to think about. Um, Plato's Symposium, in particular, Socrates' speech that he doesn't give because he just really recounts what his teacher, Diokima, said because he couldn't outdo the previous speeches. So it's Diokima speaking through Socrates uh, in the Symposium, and then the parable of uh, Martha and Mary, uh, where um, uh, so Jesus is hanging out at, I think, Martha's house, uh, or Mary's, I don't remember. I'm Catholic, so we don't remember all the specifics of scripture. But uh, um, uh, I always make that joke and almost no one laughs, but it's okay. Um, uh, if some of you know, and you're hurting me inside. Um, uh, anyway, so, so Mary's sitting at the foot of Jesus listening, intently to what he's saying, and Martha's like getting ready for dinner. And she gets really upset and tells Jesus, like, why don't you help? Uh, why don't you tell her to help? And he actually um, kind of tells Martha that Mary did the right thing. I never really liked the story very much. Um, so this is me kind of playing with the the story and the poetics of the story, interlaced with that. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of writing, as things happen, another text came in, which is Ignatius of Antioch's letter to the Romans, which is this wild, I think, like suicidal martyrdom letter that he writes uh, as he's going to Rome to be to be killed, so I mean, for good reason, maybe. Um, and there's two particular parts, and I just want to be textually clear. Uh, one is where he talks about, um, he uses a lot of Eucharistic images to describe how his body and his flesh will be um, uh, um, ground like wheat in the, in the lion's mouth. And I've always thought that was such a disgusting, beautiful, gross, grotesque, macabre uh, image. And then there's a particular line in, in Ignatius that just, I don't understand what it means at all, and it just, 
it blows me away. Because, you know, the, the, in Koine, the main word for love at the time was agape, not really eros. Eros wasn't really the, 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 the word at the time. But Ignatius uses the word eros, and he says, my eros has been crucified. <laughs> and I, with the tenses and stuff, I don't really, like I said, I don't understand what it means, but it really kind of has always struck me as a powerful passage. Um, uh, I've been interested in eros and education and have a few things, including where I compare Paulo Freire and Ratzinger, not likely pairs. Um, uh, in relation to Eros and, and the meal, and in particular the uh, Catholic um, uh, Eucharist, and with my co-author, Aki Burton, um, uh, the Passover uh, of the Seder Supper. And uh, if you're interested in that, you can check that out. But uh, this is uh, also not, it's not as ballady or as uh, anthemy or as weird. It's created in a different way, so uh, I'd like to share this one with you. It's called Martha, Maria, and Diotima. And I'm stealing the guitar part from the part that's played on the album, which is um, our wonderful banjo player, uh, Mr. Jefferson, playing a 12-string guitar. Um, and we recorded it basically just hot on the spot. I said, that sounds great. Press record, and we just did it. So I'm sort of tracing the outline of that 12-string guitar uh, through this. Um, and I have one more thing to say about that, but after this. Here's 
the same He drank the dark His heroes was cruel Amazing. By a thread that is so frail. 
the whole bars for the heart, the ocean for the brook. So 
This is our last song, and uh, um, I know I'm long, not right up against the time, but maybe I can, I've seen cheating in this room before, so I'm, I'm thinking maybe I can have five minutes if that's okay. Uh, here's Samuel's song. And, and, and thank you again for um, Colorblind Jefferson and for Yotam Bonin. Give it up for them. The Son of Man has no place, no place to rest is. 